Hi guys, uh, at these conferences a lot of hiccups happen last minute, so Tony isn't here, so we just thought we could rip for 20 minutes. Is she here? Where is Tony? Hi, you, you can't speak from the back of the stage. <laughs> wow, oh that's convenient, but we can still talk until you get set up. So. Hey Mo. <laughs> Hi everyone, are we having a good time so far? You, you could lead them, you could moderate now. <laughs> You're in the moderator's chair. This, <laughs> traditionally, yeah. Well, I'm, Where's Tony? I don't know where Tony is. Oh, she's good. Okay. We could, we could, let's take questions from the audience. Let's take questions about the... Who has a really, really difficult question? Eric Voorhees. He's got a question for us. Gosh, Tony's walking really slowly. So we have time for a few more questions. <laughs> Go ahead. That's a good question for Jez. That depends on, on the um, KPIs. So it depend on like number of users or number of unique hits or number of wallets or you know there's got to be some metric for growth because there probably isn't for uh, revenue because uh, we're kind of all pre-revenue. Do you, do you want to use a hand mic? Or, no, she, she'll go alive. She'll go alive. So. I think the typical pre-angel round. Um, uh, valuations are like in the one to five million dollar range, um, and the um, Series A rounds are, or the first um, VC rounds are in the kind of five to twenty million dollar range. So someone's nodding up front here. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Uh, okay, you're up. ready. <laughs> That's good. See you guys later. Up next, we have the ever-lovely Tony Lane, my housemate, and as you may realize, she's sometimes this late, but this is going to be a great talk. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I wasn't uh, debriefed on the process for where I was supposed to go to begin my speech. It is excellent to see everyone in this audience. And today I'm going to speak on something that I feel is both vilified and villainized in the Bitcoin community, which is the idea of marketing. You know, there is this incredible fear that so many people are dealing with right now, which is products lacking in technical substance. They're effectively using marketing as a technique to manipulate people in Bitcoin to spend their money on what is um, effectively a scheme to take advantage of people. However, marketing is also the tool that we can, will, and should use to connect with a mass audience in a way that resonates with their emotions guiding them toward a movement. So, you know, real marketing actually isn't about creating an illusion. Real marketing is about telling the truth. Because if you really want people to listen to you, that's often all you need to do. So, step one of marketing. You're unconscious. There is the power of all, which is mass and what I call mind marketing. Now, oh my goodness. Most of you may not know who this man is. He is the father of modern propaganda, and his name is Edward Bernays. He was born November 22nd, 1891, and he is responsible for what is effectively our modern polyarchical nation state, in which we live in a society where we are all governed by a series of small kingdoms funding the illusion that we may call a system of politics. The first line of his book is actually, 
the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is effectively the true ruling power of our country. Now, these ideas are pervasive today. And Edward Bernays is actually responsible for some extreme political propaganda. I don't know if you all know Chiquita Bananas. So the Chiquita Banana family is actually responsible with Edward Bernays for the overthrow of the Democratic president in Guatemala. Um, it was conducted on behalf of the multinational corporation of the United Fruit Company, renamed Chiquita Banana Brands International in 1984, and the U.S. government to facilitate the successful overthrow, Operation PB Success, of the democratically elected president of Guatemala. Now, in the same way that these ideas of marketing can be used for evil, they can also be used for good, and most of these ideas have their roots in family. So Edward Bernays actually used these techniques based on his uncle, who happens to be Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud had this idea that people are naturally unconscious and completely chaotic, that they are driven by primal and sexual desires and they have to be organized. Now another interesting story. I don't know if you all know why women smoke. Women who smoked used to be completely demonized by society. Men would say that they were unattractive, that this was a low-class habit, disgusting, vile. How could she do that? And the head of Big Tobacco actually approached Bernays and said, listen, I'm losing half of my target market. How much do I need to pay you to get women to smoke? And Bernays said, I need to hire the leading psychoanalyst. He worked with this man named Brills. And Brills essentially discovered that the cigarette is the unconscious symbol of, in of course the Freudian sense, a reproductive organ. And that this effectively gave women power over the men in a way that changed the social dynamic of society, which is exactly why they were demonized. He organized an entire movement to have women hide cigarettes under their skirts and as they were walking, he alerted the press beforehand and said these women are going to be carrying torches of freedom. So all of the stories are already halfway written. And these women walk, all of these debutantes lift up their skirts, pull out cigarettes, and as all of the flash bulbs light up, they begin smoking. And this was the evolution of that habit into modern society. Smoking became a symbol for female empowerment. So hacking the unconscious mind, two use cases. Now, this is also very interesting in a Freudian sense because examining your inner feelings essentially subverts the idea of this control. And an unexamined life is truly an empty commodity. Centralized power currently unleashes the most primal desires in humanity. And if we're using these techniques to fuel something like smoking, they can certainly be used to fuel an idea like Bitcoin into the mass mind in a way that is collectively relevant for all of us. So man's desire should overpower his needs. I have a question. These women are all Venezuelan models. And the reason why this is particularly interesting, Venezuela is obviously a huge target for mass adoption of Bitcoin. And Venezuela is currently in an absolutely terrifying state. They live in the beauty economy. These women are all symbols of national pride. And Venezuela has produced two, two Miss Earths, six Miss Worlds, seven Miss Universes, and six Miss Internationals. 
Now, Venezuela used to be an extraordinary country. And in 2006, Venezuelans were leading with the US in terms of their national pride. And in 2013, Venezuelans are actually ranked number one on the Global Misery Index. And we see this reflected in their consumption and the extremes they're willing to go through to break free of these chains. They've actually recently redesigned all of the models in Venezuela to be hyperinflated versions of the female body. People are waiting in bread lines as they are actively spending all of their income on plastic surgery as a way to get out of poverty. Uh, people are actually getting implants at 12, having their waist crushed by uh, painful straps for weeks, doing the modern corset. They're having plastic mesh sewn onto their tongues, so it is painful for them to eat. And they're having their intestines removed and shortened by the age of 16, so they can compete in what is Venezuela's beauty economy. Now, the person who actually owns the majority of the wealth in Venezuela, and the person who is the Bernays of Venezuela, is effectively running these beauty factories. And the unconscious mind in this country is primed for a change. And we are actively the people to do that. If they believe in beauty, we can transform that idea into what is essentially released from poverty, which is what they're all actively seeking. So, this is the state of the economy, and uh, this pain is our opportunity. Uh, countries like these are the number one target for mass adoption. So you're conscious, aware of what's going on. I would venture to say almost everyone in this room ventured in here conscious of these circumstances. Modern marketing is done through a different technique. While we've lived in a society that has been the power of all, and we've actually used these techniques to hack into the unconscious mind, marketers today are actually more interested in connecting with the individual. So there are four steps to the evolution of what we call math marketing. It's direct marketing, which is push. You're pushing information at someone. It's one-to-one. -one. It's human. Speaking to a brick wall and reflecting that brick wall back at someone else. Then step two, which I just covered, is mass marketing. It's a push communication, but it's one-to-all, and it's effectively hacking into the hidden desires of society at a global level. There's also CRM, which is step three, and that's an evolution that's been pull. It's one-to-one, -one, and it's a human conversation and a human dialogue. Step four is digital data, which is the most interesting and something I feel a lot of people in this room that are aware of privacy are actually deeply afraid of. So it's pull and it's unconscious. It's a connection from human to computer. You know what's fascinating? The internet is actually the closest thing we will ever have to a living lucid dream in that it is a direct projection of your unconscious mind. So everything that I just covered as far as hacking the unconscious of a mass society, finding the pain point and using that pain point to drive consumption, people are now connecting with every point of your data, knowing all of your conscious, unconscious desire and using that data to actively fuel your behavior through even search links. Now, not all marketing is bad, right? In the same way that these techniques can be used um, for Calvin Coolidge's presidential campaign to Barack Obama's presidential campaign to the Chiquita Banana family, they can also be used to fuel the idea of global financial equality. And in modern marketing, demographics are really antiquated measures to homogenize a population. You don't just want to know someone's age, their interest, activities, organizations. You want to know every touch point of their entire life and the values in the minutia. 
the finest details of character traits for every person in a highly monitored web, uh, using interest graphs from social networks to do predictive analytics even for financial markets, behavioral data from search outlets, and life cycle forecasting. Now, social networks' behavioral data from search outlets and life cycle forecasting are particularly interesting. I'll come back to this because of who our community is. So where do we find this data and this information for people in Bitcoin? You know, one of the beauties and one of the things I think we're all completely aware of as far as our modern society is that we are protective of ourselves, our identity, and our privacy. So if we want to effectively market to our people, unless you're giving your data to a centralized system, it's actually quite hard to find out who they are. So we're often too aware of the measures being taken to understand our deepest desires in the surveillance society. The techniques that I mentioned earlier, uh, which include social networks, behavioral data from search outlets, and life cycle forecasting, are actually the three most effective techniques that we can use to gain information about people who are giving their data on the open web um, that are actively using Bitcoin. So our community is pseudo-anonymous, but here's what we do know. Obviously, our target one should be these economies who have the deepest pain points, but who else should we be talking to? So there are four archetypes of people that are listening. The programming enthusiast, speculative investors, libertarians, and cyber criminals. Now, these demographics will evolve and change with time. The techniques that I gave you in the beginning of this presentation can be used to expand the demographic of your business, your idea, or the Bitcoin movement as a whole to any population that you want to target. So why are these people taking action? And this is particularly important for you if you're shaping a brand in Bitcoin, because there are a few key elements that you can actually hack into that can make your business more effective for the people you're speaking to. So the emotions behind people's involvement in Bitcoin are curiosity, profit, and politics. So who else should we be talking to? Globetrotters. When searching for flight prices, people who are inclined to use deal sites will already be psychologically accustomed to seeing prices evolve over a period of days with notifications built in for them when these flight prices are changing in the same way someone may have a price notification built in to buy or to sell Bitcoin. And what's also interesting about travel is that even if people are using Bitcoin, travel generates a lot of data. So if you do want to learn more about your customers in particular, using travel data will give you a deeper insight into who they are, their habits, why they're doing what they're doing. The other target demographic, which is most interesting to me, is actually millennials. Now, these people are 18 to 33 years old, and they account for nearly one quarter of the US population, spending more than $72 billion annually on consumer packaged goods alone. 53% of millennials use coupons from home, 54% are influenced by loyalty discounts, 37% are swayed by signs that they see, 15% acknowledge online advertising. And in this demographic, there is a complete and total lack of economic trust. They are disillusioned with commodities and they can spot an ad from a mile away and the last thing they want to have done to them is to be sold something. Thank you. So these people are victims of the machine. The Pew Research Center survey shows that half of millennials are now describe themselves as political independents, and about three in 10 say they're not affiliated with any religion. Just 19% of millennials say most people can be trusted as compared with 31% of Gen Xers, 37% of silence, and 40% of boomers. Millennials are the first people in the modern era to have higher levels of student loan debt, poverty, unemployment, and lower levels of wealth and personal income than their other two immediate predecessor generations. 
They're also in an amorphous stage of self. They're entering into the market. They're building habits. They're open to innovation. They're frequently found to be global travelers, spending their money on experiences. They're also natural advocates because of their use of social media. They want to share all of the information, all of the tips, the tricks, the techniques, because their life is lived through one global text message that is Twitter or through an entire global society of Facebook. They're also fraying from this tradition of institution, and they are primed to take up and advocate for this decentralized idea of society as most of these millennials are also global travelers who want to spend their money on experiences. So, oh my gosh. So, let me wrap and say there are three movements going on right now. Um, on a mass level that are actually helping to fuel these ideas of Bitcoin to a major audience. One is the HBO documentary, there's another Sundance documentary, and there is the Bitcoin Music Festival. I would love to hear all of your thoughts on your personal brand, your marketing, and how we can connect to this demographic in a way that can shape positively the evolution of global financial equality. Thank you. <laughs>